Welcome back, everyone. For today's video, we are going to be taking a look at the fourth round of the Chess Olympiad being held in Budapest, Hungary. Now, the first game we're going to be taking a look at features the five-time world champion, Magnus Carlsen, who had quite an adventure yesterday, getting to the playing site, riding by bike, missing his badge, showing up 11 minutes late, but being able to play the game and eventually win. So today we have Magnus playing with white pieces against Victor Gazik, rated 2561, and let's jump right into the action. So Magnus plays the move E4 after one minute, clearly no issues getting to the playing site, and today we are not going to have any massive drama. So we get D4, Gazik plays the move Knight F6, and now we get the move C4, E6, Knight to F3, and now we have the move Bishop B4. Now normally on move number three, there are three main options. White can play Knight C3, Knight to F3, or G3, and in this game, Magnus decides to play Knight F3. Here we get the move bishop b4, and now we have knight bd2, and this is what is known as the Bogo Indian defense. We have the move b6 being played, and now we have the move a3, bishop takes d2 being played. Bishop e7, by the way, is another very sharp line in modern times after e4 and d6. There are many games that have been played. White is maybe a little bit better due to the big white center, but the show goes on. Instead, Gazik takes a knight on d2, and now Magnus plays his move knight takes d2. Now, usually in this position, white either plays queen takes d2 or this move bishop takes d2. Taking with the knight is a little bit uncommon in the position, but I actually really like this from Magnus because he's showing his understanding of A, the position, but B, the fact that in this situation, they're kind of out of theory pretty early, and he's going to have these two Bs, and there's nothing really happening for a long time. So we get the move bishop b7. Magnus now plays the move e3. We get the move castles, and we have the move bishop d3 being played here. Now, Magnus is offering the free juicer on g2, but unlike the game we saw yesterday with Anish, in this position, taking the pawn on g2 would be very bad, because after rook g1 and bishop b7, white can play something like e4 with e5 right away. Computer actually even likes b3 here, simply gambiting a pawn, where you go bishop b2 with queen f3 coming up, and with the two b's aimed towards the king, the rook aimed towards the pawn on g7, White is simply doing very well. So, Gazik does not take up the challenge with Bishop Takes Pawn, and I actually kind of understand it. You're, you know, you have to think about it from his perspective. He's rated 2561, he's playing the world champion, the greatest player in the world, and he probably thinks, well, I'm just going to play a positional game. The problem, of course, is that after d5 and castles here, we have a positional game, but Magnus has two Bs on the board, and what this means is that the game is going to go on forever. There are no obvious exchanges or trades, and Magnus is already in cruise control. We get the move D takes C4, Knight takes C4, and now we have the move Queen D5 being played. And here Magnus goes F3 to stop the checkmate threat towards the king on G2. Gazik plays Rook D8, and now Magnus goes for Bishop E2. And this is simply a phenomenally strong move by Magnus. It doesn't look particularly special, and it probably actually to most people seems kind of weird. But the big issue that White has in the position is that Black would love to go C5 here, putting immense pressure on the pawn on D4 or the bishop on D3. So, when Magnus goes bishop e2, now if black plays move c5 here, white can simply take the juicer, you don't hang the bishop on d3. If black were to capture the queen, you sack the rook, and you lose the game on the spot. If you were to say trade the queens here, trade everything off, and take on c5, not b5, sorry, you take on c5 here. After e4 here, white builds this classic chain of three pawns in the center. And with bishop e3 coming up, say knight bd7, bishop e3, followed by rook c1. This weak pawn on c5 is a huge issue, and the central chain of three stops black from ever putting anything on the d5 square, and white is simply positionally winning. So... We get the move knight c6 instead, and now Magnus plays queen c2. A nice logical move. You have rook to d1, bringing the rook to guard the pawns. You can also play b3 or b4. And the third reason queen c2 makes a lot of sense is maybe you can also create some pressure on the c file as well. So a multi-purpose move for Magnus, and now we get to move rook a c8, and Magnus goes b3 here. Simple, simple understanding. Magus is trying to develop the bishop. Long term, the reason the two Bs are so powerful here and why white has such an advantage is that white can basically set up the Bs on these two squares, and eventually you put a rook on d1 to protect the pawn on d4, and then you go e4 here. Now you have a big white center. You have the two Bs. Eventually, you'll achieve perfect harmony with rook c1. Rook's on the open files. Eventually, d5 to open up the scope, and white is completely winning, even though material is equal here. So, in this position, Gazik decides to go b5, and this is a move that's not great, but I understand what he's doing. He's desperate to try and create counterplay before Magus achieves the perfect setup, and he decides to lash out with b5. 
Now here, Magus goes knight b2, which is another excellent move in this position. You're probably thinking, well, if you go to d2, you're fine. But actually, black would be able to sack the horse here with knight takes d4. And after takes, takes, we have the queen checking the king and targeting the rook at the same time. We also have a nice pyramid here. And after king h1, queen takes a1, you might think bishop b2, queen a2, and rook a1, you trap the queen. But black can sack the rook with rook takes d2. And after takes and queen b3, black is much better, if not winning. So Magnus goes knight bd2, a nice move here, intending to reroute the horse to d3 and go to the c5 square, where there's a bastion, and you target the bishop on b7. Gazak plays e5, and now Magnus plays another great move, knight to d3. And this is simply a positional masterpiece from Magnus here, because now black can actually take what looks like a free pawn. But after e4 is played here, say you go queen h5, white can now play this move, queen c5. Actually, probably most thematic here would be to play... Uh, let's just say a move like bishop f4 here. Let's just say a6, rook c1. And with queen c5 or knight c5 coming in combined with rook d1, white is actually much better here. I'm trying to think of a way to explain it in basic terms. But effectively, you have the weak pawn on c7. You have a weak pawn on d4. And white will be able to win something here in the long run. Now, this is a very advanced concept, to be fair. It's not really easy to explain why white is much better here at, at a basic level, but white is much better if black takes, which is why Victor Gazak plays the move e4 instead. And now Magnus goes knight to c5 here, attacking the bishop, forking the bishop and the pawn at the same time, and Gazak plays knight takes d4. Now, what Gazak is hoping for here is that when he goes for the tactics, he's creating something complicated and maybe the tactics will work out for him. I strongly applaud this decision because Gazak is losing this position positionally. So if he can create complications tactically, there are chances for him to overcome the rating deficit and maybe catch Magnus off guard. So Magnus takes the horse. We get queen takes pawn, king to h1, and now Gazak takes the pawn on f3. Here, Magus takes back with the pawn, and now we get this move, bishop a being played. Now, remember earlier, there was a line that I showed with queen takes a1, bishop b2, and queen a2 with rook a1. But here you'll notice there is no knight on d2. This knight has mysteriously transported to c5, and therefore the queen is actually trapped here. If you play rook d2, sacking the rook, I take, and now the knight magically guards the pawn, queen guards the bishop, and the sad queen on a2 will leave the board on the next turn. So Gazak goes bishop a8 here. Now white is up a piece in the position, but Gazak is hoping with this long diagonal, maybe he can swing the queen over. Say you were able to get some position like this, for example, and bring the knight to g4. Suddenly there are all kinds of threats towards the white king. So Magnus here plays the move bishop g5. Computer gives many moves as being good, but I actually rather like bishop g5 because you simply are trading off the bishop for the knight. Gazak plays the move rook to d5. We get bishop takes knight. Queen takes bishop, and here we have the move knight e4 being played. Another nice move here, trying to shut down this diagonal. And if white can bring the piece to the center of the board without getting mated on this long diagonal by the bishop, what the material will play. Gazak goes queen f4, and now Magnus plays queen c1. Another nice touch here. If you were to play rook a d1, black has ideas like rook to h5, lifting the rook and trying to checkmate the white king. So we get queen c1. Now we have queen h4 being played. And here, Magnus goes rook g1. We get the move rook to e5, and we have queen c3. Now, if black were to go rook h5, which is the other option, white simply goes rook to g2, stopping the checkmate here. If black takes the knight after takes, now your rook is on pre, and white will win. And if you play, let's just say, a move like rook e8 to illustrate the point, white will go queen c3, rook e5, and now after rook, H, rook a g1, white is suddenly attacking on the king side, and black is the one who is losing. So we get rook e5 here. Gazak is desperately hoping here that he can sack the rook with rook takes knight, take with the queen, and checkmate Magnus on this long diagonal with the double A battery. Magnus, of course, is having none of it. He plays move queen c3, attacking the rook. If you sack the rook with rook takes e4, there's queen takes g7, checkmate in uno, and you resign the game. So Gazak goes for the move rook c to e8, and now Magnus takes his pawn on b5. Many ways to win, but Magnus showing some flair here. Sacks the bishop temporarily. If you were to take the bishop, again, it's checkmate in uno. And after you play this move, uh, like let's say you were to move the rook, you hang your rook on e5. So now both of d's rooks are super weak with a double stack. You also have the mate on g7 here. Sorry if my arrows are a little bit off, um, but you have all these checkmating ideas. Gazak goes rook e7, and now Magnus plays rook a d1 creating the classic ice skater checkmate threat with rook to d8, and Gazak resigns the game here because he really doesn't have a good move. 
If you were to move the rook to e6 so that the queen covers a d8 square, white has many ways to win. Probably the cleanest one that I would suggest is simply queen takes c7 here, again threatening the checkmate on d8. And if black plays, say, bishop takes e4 here, you simply can play queen to d8, checking the king and hitting the queen. And if black were to block with the rook, for example, you take the queen, and after it takes rook g2, very important here that rook e1 is not a checkmate because the queen covers the square. So after it takes, takes, and queen takes e1, white wins the game. And if you were to play h6, another option, you go rook d8, check, king h7. And now after rook takes a, let's just say black sacks the rook with rook e4, there's still queen g7 mate. So here white has an extra bishop and a knight here, and the game is simply over. So a masterful performance from Magnus in, game, in the second game of the tournament in the fourth round overall. Just a very, very clean game from him. No drama, no chance for opponent. Magnus is showing great positional play so far. Really, I think, highlighting the difference between elite grandmasters and, say, 25 to 2,600 GMs, where if you just get a position, you keep a lot of pieces on the board, you just start maneuvering and playing the game, you will be a lot better than your opponents. All right. So... Magnus gets a second win in the event, but now the next thing we're going to be taking a look at features one of the gold medal favorites in this event, the United States of America playing against the Ukraine. Now, this match, very high stakes, a lot of drama, so I'm going to set up the scene before we jump into the game. On board number one, Fabiano Caruana won a game against Alexander, Vol or not Alexander, sorry, Andre Volokitin. On board two, there was a... Uh, board two, which is this board, sorry, is going on. And board three with a draw between Lenier Dominguez and Ruslan Ponomarov. And on board four, Anton Korobov won a great game against Ray Robson. So the match is all square at one and a half, one and a half. And now we're going to jump into this game played between one of the great legends of the game of chess, Vasily Ivanchuk. Now, Vasily, I believe, is 51 years old. He's a little bit past his prime. But when we talk about greats of the games, players who did not become world champion, but showed phenomenal talent and ability, Chuki, as he is affectionately known, shows great, great ability. He had a fantastic win against Gary Kasparov and Lenares, a game that I think I recapped some time ago. Um, He's won games against pretty much all the top players. I myself have played him. He's beaten me. Um, and he might be past his prime, but he's still a very dangerous player and one of the great legends of the game. So in this game, he's playing against Wesley So. Now, there is also a little bit of backstory to this. Wesley So and Vasily Ivanchuk, they played in the FIDE World Cup, I want to say around 2010. And Wesley crushed Vasily after this loss. Vasily said he was going to retire from chess. Now, those words were short-lived, and he came back to chess, but there definitely is some history. So one and a half, one and a half, and let's jump right into the action. Game starts with d4, knight f6, we get c4, e6, knight c3, bishop b4, and now we have the move queen c2. Now, this, of course, is the classic Nimzo Indian defense, which we've already seen quite a bit in this tournament. Um, but here we have the queen c2 line being played. Now, this line is one of the older lines. It's considered the most solid, but generally it's very hard to create winning chances with white. So what you're aiming for is a position where you're a little bit better, but very low chance of losing, and most likely the game will be a draw. Wesley castles, we get a3, takes, takes, and now we have the move d5. And here, Vasily plays knight f3. Wesley trades on c4 and now plays the move b6. Now, this system is played by all the top players. I myself have had this position on many occasions with the black pieces. And here we got the move bishop g5. Now, one thing that I want to point out here is that there is this move h4, which was originally invented by Gary Kasparov, one of the all-time greats as well, uh, back when he made his comeback to chess in 2017. And the reason I point this out is that the, this move, it looks very awkward, but Gary played it, and ever since then, there are a lot of positions where you're looking for these strange ideas of pushing the pawn on the edge of the board. So we get bishop g5, bishop a6, queen to a4 is played, and now Wesley goes queen d7. Here we get queen c2, c5, takes rook c8, and now we have rook d1 and queen e7. Now at this point, this is all still theory. I myself have played this position with both colors, and here the two main moves are e4 or e3. Both are playable, both are extremely solid. Generally, the games end in draws very quickly thereafter. Chuki, however, plays the move queen a4. We get pawn takes pawn, and now we have this move h4 being played. You probably were thinking, why did I mention h4? And this is why. Because here, h4 looks like a very strange move, but with Gary having played it before, you start to consider these ideas in modern chess, whereas you never would have considered them before. Now, the other point that I want to make here is that probably in a team event, it's very difficult to figure out what to do at this point in the match, because I gave you the score one and a half, one and a half. It looked like Fabiano was a little bit worse on board one, Korobov was much better on board four, and board three game was pretty pretty balanced between Dominguez and, and uh, Ponomarov. So Chuki probably felt here that he needed to play for his team, play for country, try to create more rather than simply make a draw. 
So we get h4. Wesley plays c4, and now we get this move rook h3. What Vasily is aiming to do here is to activate the rook here on h3. Maybe go rook g3, maybe down the road, even something like knight e5, followed by a rook f3 move to pressure the horse, or something like rook c3 as well. So it looks a little bit awkward, but actually computer rather likes white's position after rook h3, and now Wesley plays h6. Now here, Chuki goes queen c2, and this is the start of embarking on a path of trying to create chaos here, trying to be an artist and create a big imbalance. Now, what the computer wants here is bishop to d2, trying to reroute the bishop to this other diagonal to pressure the knight on f6. But still, after a move like bishop to b7, black is completely fine. So we get queen c2. Wesley plays knight bd7. He does not take the bishop on g5, because after takes, takes, say you were to move the knight, there's queen h7 check, king f8, queen h8, uh-oh, spaghetti -o. King gets checkmated, and if you play knight d7 here, for example, now white can simply take and play g4 followed by g5. And with this open age file and the weak king on g8, black is in a lot of trouble. So Wesley plays knight bd7, Chuki plays knight d4. Now we get bishop b7, and here we have the move bishop d2. Now you will notice computer does not like what white has done, primarily because black has a lot of squares in the center of the board for these knights, but even the ability to push a pawn. And with this rook on h3, it might look kind of interesting, but it's not really going anywhere. You don't really have any attacks in the center of the board. Your pawns can't go there. If you could get f3, for example, just to illustrate a point, F3 with either E4 or potentially G4, G5 with a rook behind the pawn. Now you start to talk about a serious position where there could be an attack, but at the moment, white is lagging behind. Also, white has not moved this king or the bishop on F1. So, Wesley goes A5, and now Ivanchuk plays F3 with the idea of stopping a knight E4, bishop E4 here, but he also wants to push either G4, E4 with the pronged pawns. Wesley goes queen c5, and now we get to move bishop to e3. Now, computer says bishop c3 is better, and the reason is very dank. It's because the bishop on this diagonal actually works harmoniously with the rook coming to g3. Probably Chugi saw knight e5, and he thought, uh-oh, there's knight e3 to fork the bishop, the rook, and the queen. And after rook g3, knight f6, you figure, well, what are you doing? Black's just better. You're not in time to attack on this diagonal. However, you are actually in time, as the computer shows, because you can sack the horse, and after takes, you can sack the rook with rook takes knight. If black were to capture with the knight, now after rook g7, king f8, and queen to h7, you're simply getting a ladder checkmate on g8 or h8 here, and black will lose the game. And after you sack the rook, if black takes with a pawn, bishop takes f6, rook c7, now there's queen c3 lining up this massive threat, as well as a classic 90 degree right triangle towards the pawn on g7. And after queen f8 and bishop d4, White is actually much better because you have this double A battery as well as a wooden shield with a bishop on d4. More importantly, in the long run, the bishop is planted forever, so you always spy the pawn. And you can always reroute your other bishop down the road to this long diagonal towards the black king on c2. And black has no way of getting rid of this bishop. Now, of course, it's a very deep line. It's a very deep concept. Um, but it really shows how great computers are because as soon as you see bishop c3 with rook g3, now everything makes sense. h4 and rook h3 with rook g3, perfect sense. But for us humans who are not 3,500, very difficult to play. And Vasily goes bishop e3, trying to line up some fossils here by moving the knight, but also thinking that in the long run, if he can get the rook to g3 here, the bishop is much better on this diagonal, spying the pawn, than it would be on c3, spying towards the pawn on g7. So Wesley goes c3 here, a nice move, avoiding all, or not avoiding, but ignoring all the fossils here. White doesn't really have a move, a square to move the knight to. If you go to f5, I take the horse. If you go to b5 or b3, it uh, doesn't really matter because I take the bishop and win the game since you can't capture the queen. And so c3 simply is good. So Vasily trades the queens off. He goes bishop to c1 here. Now white is still behind the development. You have the bishop on f1, which isn't in the game. But since it's an end game, white has time to play e4, g4. But that being said, black should be a little bit better. So Wesley goes bishop a6. We get to move e4 here. We get the trade of the bishops. And now we have rook a c8. Now, at this point, it's clear that Wesley has the advantage because even though White has finished the development and created a chain of three, you have a weak pawn on a3, your bishop on c1 is weak, and most importantly, you have this rook on h3 that is simply out of play. Even if you were to get some position like bishop to b2 and rook c5 here, this rook, you'd much rather have it on, for example, just to illustrate this, you'd much rather have this position with the rooks on c1 and d1 than the actual position here with this rook on h3. Or even if you go to g3 with no queens on the board, there really is no actual threat towards the king on g8. So Vasily goes g4 here. Wesley plays knight to b6, trying to activate the horse to either c4, a4. And now we get this move, rook h2. 
Knight c4 is played, and now we get to move king to e1. Important, by the way, that white doesn't simply move the bishop, because then there's knight to e3, forking the king and the rook. So we get king e1, we have knight takes bishop, rook takes, rook to c3, and now Vasily goes a4. Wesley plays rook to a3, attacking the pawn on a4, and now we have rook b6. Wesley plays rook to d8, and this is sort of the start where I feel like Wesley kind of loses a little bit of the thread here. Computer wants rook c to c3 with the idea of e5 to check and win this pawn on f3 here. And after rook c c3, the best that white can do is go rook to b2. And now after rook takes a4, for example, black is just much better up a pawn on the queen side. Instead, Wesley goes rook d8. We got to move rook b5. g6 is played here. Rook takes a4 once again would be fine, but after knight c6, Wesley probably thought that if he goes rook to a8 and white plays rook b7 followed by knight to e5, it's going to be very hard to win this game. And if you were to trade the rooks after rook a3, king e2, let's just say, I don't know, knight d7, for example, white will take the pawn and make a draw. So Wesley wants to go for more and he plays move g6. Now we get knight to b3, rook to c8 is played, and we have the move king e2. Wesley, of course, could trade the rooks and make a draw any time, but he's trying to go for glory. We get to move rook c4, rook d8, king g7, and now we have the move g5 being played. Wesley decides here to sack the knight, and this is really a turning point in the game. In this situation, you have to assess what is the match situation. First of all, are, is a draw good enough, or do you need to try to win? But then also you have to assess that after you sack the horse here in this position, can you actually lose this position? Now, simply put, you should never be able to lose here, which I which I would say because black is going to probably be able to win this last pawn at h4. Even if you get some position, don't worry about the eval bar because I'm just setting it up. Even if white were somehow able to um somehow able to uh just to set it up. Even if white somehow were able to get this position with rook and knight versus rook, this position would still be a theoretical draw. So when Wesley decides to sack the knight here, he's figuring he thinks that he can play for more, but he also figures there's zero risk of losing. So we get this position after king f2, and here Wesley decides to take the pawn on a4, and this is where I think it starts to get a little bit tricky. He could have played rook to f4, and after king g2 takes, this actually would be a better version than the game as we're about to see, um, but at any rate, there's really no chance of losing. Wesley instead takes the pawn, and now we get to move knight to d4, and now the position is starting to get very tricky here because you no longer can win the lone pawn on h4, and if white can get this knight to f3, actually we should ignore the eval bar for one second, but just to set it up, if white can get a position like this, with the knight on f3 guarded by the king, and now the activity to start using his rooks on the back ranks, there is no way to force a draw because the pawn on h4 is now guarded. So Wesley plays move rook to a2, we get king g3, rook a3, and now after knight f3, you'll notice that all of a sudden, everything is turned around, and Wesley is now in a lot of trouble here, because he has a very weak pawn on f7, which can be targeted by the rooks, and he has no way atta to attack the knight or the pawn or the king here on this third rank, and already here, Wesley is going to have to be very, very careful to not lose the game. Wesley ends up playing this move rook e2, and this move simply loses on the spot. The computer says after king g7, Rook to d7, king to f6, rook bb7 and e5, takes king e6, rook g7. White is better here, but the show goes on. It does not lose on the spot. But when Wesley plays rook e2, now there is rook to b7, and Wesley's initial idea, which I think was to play rook e3, no longer works here because you take the pawn and you guard the horse. But more importantly, you're now threatening checkmate and uno with rook to h8 as a black king can't escape dodge. So Wesley is in all kinds of trouble suddenly, and he plays this move rook to e5, desperately trying to keep the game going. But now after rook takes f7, rook h8 has become an almost impossible threat. Wesley goes g5 here, hoping that after rook h8, he can go king g6. But now Vasily shows no mercy at all. He plays this move h5 here, and if you don't capture the pawn, you get mated. If you play rook f5, rook h8 is again a checkmate, so you have to take the pawn. But now after rook to f6, Wesley so resigns the game here because the king has no escape hatch. You could sack the rook here, but after you sack the rook, with two rooks versus a rook and three pawns, white is still completely winning. Actually, I think it's still a forced checkmate almost, unless you go rook to f5. But in this end game with the rook gobbling up the pawns, white will win the game. And if you don't sack the rook, there is literally no way to stop checkmate in one. If you go g4, rook h8, for example, king has no square on g5 or g6 here. King is simply stuck on the edge of board, and you lose the game. So after rook to f6, Wesley so has to resign the game. And with that, we get our first epic upset of the tournament. I would say epic from the standpoint that the four favorites, in my opinion, are Uzbekistan, the United States, China, and India. 
So we get our first massive upset with the United States losing to Ukraine by a score of two and a half to one and a half. Now, alongside the U.S. losing, however, one of the other massive favorites would also suffer a huge defeat. That would, of course, be Uzbekistan, where Min Lei, the very well-known chess player uh, from Vietnam, who's played a lot online, who's played a lot online, he goes by Wonderful Time, has a huge win in one of his games to help Vietnam defeat Uzbekistan. There is a little bit of irony as well, which I will point out to that, which is that the coach of Uzbekistan is Vladimir Kramnik who has accused Minlay of cheating in Title Tuesday. So a little bit of karma there with Minlay bringing home the bacon for Vietnam. So he's got two epic upsets today. Uzbekistan and the United States both lose in the fourth round of the event. It's going to be an uphill struggle. Uzbekistan gold medal winners last time. We'll see if they can get back into the hunt. And for the United States, also a huge shock. And we'll see if they can start winning some matches and try to challenge. But at the moment, it's looking like India is a clear favorite. All their players are firing Arjun on four out of four. Gukesh having a great tournament. Prague being very solid. Um, and it's looking very unlikely at the moment that anyone except India is going to win the gold medal. But there are still many rounds to go. So on that note, I hope you guys have enjoyed this recap from the fourth round of the chess 45th Chess Olympiad being held in Budapest, Hungary. If you are not already subscribed to the channel, make sure that you smash that subscribe button below. And we'll be back tomorrow with another recap. I'll try to get back downstairs. Uh, I had a power supply issue with my computer, but we'll try to get back downstairs the next day or two to do recordings. But for right now, this will have to suffice. So I hope it's okay for you guys. Um, but anyway, hope you enjoyed it and I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. See you guys soon. Bye.